Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I am Anna Summers, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on March 24th, where are all the rest of the records on the Family Search website and update with James Tanner? If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our web webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Dave Obi, who will be giving a presentation on a fresh light on newspapers. Dave Obi is a journalist and a genealogical researcher who has written a dozen books and given more than 600 presentations at conferences and seminars in Canada, the United States, and Australia since 1997. He is an editor and publisher of the Times Colonist Daily Newspaper in Victoria, British Columbia. He has worked as a journalist and journalist in British Columbia and Alberta since 1972 and has been researching family history since 1978. In 2012, Dave was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws for the University of Victoria for his work as a historian, genealogist, and journalist. He was a member of the Services Consultation Committee at Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa for four years. Dave is a columnist for Internet Genealogy Magazine and Your Genealogy Today Magazine, formerly Family Chronicle. And Dave, if you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Anna, uh, and welcome to everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here again for, for, an, for another session. I, I enjoy doing these and I hope that you enjoy them as well. Uh, the topic today is uh, fresh light on old newspapers. Basically reviewing some of the, um, the newspapers, uh, ways, ways to research newspapers, ways to get more information out of newspapers. Looks great. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, so it's it's a fairly lengthy talk today, but which we'll do our best to be to be finished it at by by roughly uh, within within an hour basically, and um, a lot of examples here are from my own family or, or people that I've come across as I've been doing research, and there are examples from Canada as well as the United States. So bear with me. A lot of the ideas that I'm showing are ideas that can be shown or that can be applied anywhere you are in the world because the basics of uh, newspaper research are pretty much the same wherever you go. And um, as she mentioned, I am the, uh, the editor and publisher of the, uh, the uh, daily newspaper in Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, as part of that, I've been involved in digitization projects. I've written the histories of the, of the history, or histories of the newspapers. And uh, I've done a lot of research in old newspapers over the years. And along the way, I've picked up things like these copies of newspapers, which are uh, from 1868. Um, I was given these by another historical researcher one time, and I, I found them fascinating to see the differences in terms of quality between uh, the printed version and what we see online on digitized sites, that kind of thing. But I'll get into this, into some of that later on. Um, I run a site called Can Genealogy, which is a link site for research in Canada um, with special pages for newspapers and special pages for directories, as well as the, the basic, uh, basic sites by province. And there's a handout for this uh, talk today. Go to daveobi.com and you'll see where the handout is under, it's just under the name of the of this session, the date and name of this session. It's uh, fairly easy to find. It's a four page PDF and a quick and easy download in theory. Newspapers talk about who, what, when, where, and why. And no other source so closely reflects the goals of genealogy because in genealogy, we're interested in the who, what, when, where, and why as well. There's no other source that, that sort of so closely matches or mirrors um, genealogy as, as, an, as a newspaper does. As the old newspapers give us a huge amount of information that we wouldn't find elsewhere. They, they might help us confirm information. They, they add details and context uh, to, the, to the research that we're doing. We can correct, clarify official records. We can, we can see where, things, where mistakes have been made in official records. We can fill in gaps. And, and often we can answer the why question, which frankly is the toughest question that genealogists have. Why did our ancestors do that? Or, or why did they move there? Why did they get married? Whatever, you know, like, like they might get some sense uh, of the why question. 
Finding newspapers these days, more and more and more, they're digitized and on the internet. Um, I have, I've got subscriptions to all the major sites because uh, they're, they're, they're so valuable. Not all of the newspapers are on pay sites. There are some that are, that are on free sites and they can be found through local libraries, that kind of thing. Um, I, I was involved in the digitization of our own paper. We've got 150 years of the, of the newspaper online for free. Uh, papers can also be found on microfilm at libraries. I've also bought some over the years, the microfilm reels from different libraries so I could research them on them on my leisure. And quite often you'll find them in bound volumes at local libraries and archives. And those are still handy sometimes, even if you have access to microfilm or the digitized version, because in some cases the order will be different. I looked at a microfilm one time and, and it was just, it was miserable for me because there was no order. The pages, the papers had been taken out of order when they were microfilm. So I got, I grabbed a bound volume and they were all in chronological order and therefore I could find what I was looking for. So you might need all three, just because you have them digitized, you might not find, you might not find uh, what, you know, what you need. In one case, the microfilm for the Seattle Times, um, I wanted one obituary and the obituary page had not been microfilmed that day. So I had to, had to check a bound volume to see what, what I could find on that. Several different sites are available. Newspapers.com is one of the major ones that ties in with Ancestry. There's also Newspaper Archive and Genealogy Bank. There, there are three of the major, major sites that you should be looking for, uh, for, five, for using newspapers. But there are many, many other sites as well. There are smaller sites, more regional sites, local sites, that kind of thing. Give you some examples of what you can do with uh, with newspapers, and most of you, I'm sure, will, will remember the uh, the movie that had "Don't Call Me Shirley" as a, one of the one of the funny lines in it. Um, that takes us to the Nielsen family in Brandon, Manitoba. There was born uh, born to Mr. and Mrs. I Nielsen a son, Ingvard Gordon, in 1922. That appears in the in the Brandon Daily Sun. The reason I included the uh, the ad from below the birth announcement is because it looks kind of cool. And that's one thing you have to, have to watch for when you're doing research. Don't be distracted too much by the by by the by the cool ads or things you find, the other stories you find, that kind of thing. Just stay focused. Um, and that's tough to do because one of the thrills about genealogy, of course, is is we allow ourselves to be distracted because that's often where the fun is. But you know, bear in mind that sometimes you'll find really, really cool stuff. Sure, make a copy of it, but get back to what you're, what you're working on. Because newspaper research can take many, many, many hours to complete. Because I suggest you, know, you don't simply rely on, on what, the, what, what, what a basic search gives you. You should be looking deeper than that. And I'll tell you why later. So the 1921 census, towards the bottom there, there's Ingvard Nielsen. Uh, he's the father of, uh, of a certain actor. 1926 census, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. You'll find uh, uh, Ingvard Nielsen and his three sons, Gordon, Eric, and Leslie. And Ingvard was the was also briefly in the in the movies. His uh, son Leslie uh, arranged him to for him to be in a, a a few small roles on movies he was making. The two sons that are most notable, one is uh, you know we, we all know Leslie Nielsen, the actor. His brother Eric was the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada in the 1980s, so sort of the second most powerful person in Canadian politics. So a very, very notable family. But you go looking a bit, trying to find a bit of information on Leslie Nielsen's early days. And uh, this is just doing basic, basic searches of uh, on newspapers.com. I came across a reference to him in the Edmonton Journal in Alberta in 1942. And down towards the bottom, uh, he was not mentioned as an actor, he was mentioned on the production staff. So he realized that what he did, he learned, he, you know, he got his start basically by on the, working on the production staff, learning the entire, the entire sort of process in terms of putting on stage plays and so on. Um, he didn't start as, a, as, as an actor. Calgary Herald, 1946, he was, uh, he was working as a radio announcer in Calgary at that point. And, uh, um, I actually knew someone years and years ago who uh, worked at the same cafe that he went to, and uh, she admitted to having a major, major crush on Leslie Nielsen because he was so smooth and a great voice and so on. In this case, 
he wrote a, um, a letter to the editor uh, basically saying, keep the Poles out of Canada. We don't want people from Poland here. Um, we, you know, it's, 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 it seems relevant in some ways, given the fact that we're now looking at Ukrainian refugees um, trying to find somewhere else to go. But, but at the time, Poland, refugees from Poland were the issue, and he, he put, his, put his thoughts out there. Kansas City Star, 1950, there's a reference to him appearing on television. Um, there, by, by the early 1950s, you'll start finding many, many references to Leslie Nielsen as his fame grew. 1952, his photograph appeared in the Calgary Herald. He had been, of, of course, in Calgary uh, for a few years. And uh, so the local paper there certainly was excited to see um, the photographs of Leslie Nielsen coming over the wire service and so on. So where he had lived, they remembered Leslie Nielsen so much, they would run almost every story they could. But in time, where he lived didn't matter anymore. Where he had lived didn't matter anymore because he was so famous otherwise. It wasn't just local boy makes good anymore. It was a big star out there. Um, so after that, after the movie fifties on, you, you'll find plenty of stories on him. It's the earlier ones you're looking for, the earlier references to the family that make a difference. That's just one example of how you can get a bit of information from newspapers. I've got another case that is, um, um, I, I first came across this one about 20 years ago, uh, just something popped out at me as I was dealing with, uh, as I was going through some some uh, death inquests and so on, inquest inquisitions, whatever, um, coroner reports on, on deaths. And this one just stood out. Um, basically, it was Charles H. Marble. And the reason that it really stood out, he drowned in the Fraser River after descending by parachute from a balloon. This was in 1894. Uh, Fraser River is uh, basically the around Vancouver, British Columbia, just south of Vancouver. Um, and he was at the New Westminster Fair, which is the sort of the city a couple over from Vancouver. That's where he, that's where he went into, the, into the, uh, the water and died. First document about it that I could find, this is, this is his, uh, his death record. Charles H. Marble on the 10th of October, 1894, male, 26 years old. He was an aeronaut by profession, born Los Angeles, California. And uh, it was determined that he had died in uh, uh, drowning accidentally. What we know about Charles from the official record, uh, name Charles H. Marble, birthplace Los Angeles, California, birth year about 1868. The second official document was an inquisition, similar to an inquest, uh, talking about uh, what had happened. And by the time they were finished, they decided that basically the person who organized uh, his, uh, his ascent had done nothing wrong. Um, the five-man jury said Marble died accidentally, casually, and by misfortune. Casually and by misfortune. Star witness was Alfred Henry Soper. He was the one who had hired uh, Marble. He said, he said Marble was experienced in this kind of thing, and he blamed Marble for what had happened. Um, he, he would be the one who would have been found liable if there had been any kind of witness uh, to say that, uh, to, to, to speak against him. You know, so it was in his best interest to say it was not his fault, it was Marble's fault. So therefore he wouldn't face any charges or whatever in, in terms of what happened. Um, so he blamed Marble and uh, he said Marble was experienced and so on. Um, the jury found basically on his, on his side. So that is the end of official records. That is all you can find out. You've got the death registration plus the inquest. That is all you've got. But newspapers will give you a lot more information about this. First of all, trying to get more information about the, uh, the event itself, it was the annual fair in New Westminster. And, and I found the ad, the ad for the fair in the New Westminster paper. And down towards the bottom of the ad, balloon ascension and parachute drop each day by Professor Soper of Saginaw, Michigan. Um, gives me information of where Soper was from, from Saginaw, Michigan. But it says it's going to be by Professor Soper. Um, a lot of people called themselves Professor back in the day when they were doing this kind of thing. But he, was, he wasn't the one who was killed. He didn't, he's not the one who went up. It was someone else. It was Charles Marble who went up in the, in the balloon. Um, uh, this is not from that. This just shows a balloon ascent somewhere in the Midwest in the 1880s. I went looking for a photograph showing showing this kind of thing, and the best I could find was from the, from as I say from the Midwest. Um, 
these were really, really popular events at fairs uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, before, before planes were, were a thing. They had these balloon ascents and then people would parachute down to earth or do acrobatic tricks, you know, 100 or 200 feet above the crowd, that kind of thing. The Columbia newspaper is published in the Westminster, British Columbia. And it said that Marble had performed several daring feats on the trapeze bar. The balloon reached 1500 feet, descended into the Fraser River, parachute kept Marble underwater and that Marble had friends in Edison, Washington, which is the first real clue beyond him being born in LA, um, the first real clue about where he was from. And the Colonist newspaper in, uh, in Victoria, which was the largest new newspaper in British Columbia at the time, said that Marble was wearing pink tights. The ascent started around 4 p.m. He was watched by 8,000 people, which is questionable given the number of people who lived in the province at the time. Uh, Marble was 21, had a stepfather named Cook in Auburn, Washington. And Soper was from Saginaw, Michigan, which we already saw, and he had a restaurant in Seattle. Um, so here we're getting more information on both of the people involved in this. Marble was 21, and he had a stepfather named Cook in Auburn, Washington. So right now we're, we're starting to dive a bit more into the family. The first report was wrong because it said that Soper had been killed. The reason it was wrong was because that, that story was written in a hurry when the, when the accident happened and Soper had been identified as the person who would be going up on the ascent. So when, when the person on the ascent who was believed to be Soper um, died, you know, believed to be Soper. So therefore the, the stories would say Soper had been killed. A later story said, you know, the first one is incorrect. Soper is a Seattle restaurant keeper and hired Charles Marble of Auburn, Washington to make the ascension. Marble was hurt, not Soper. He never regained consciousness. So now we're learning that, that Soper had hired Marble um, to make the ascent and, he, and Soper had a, had a restaurant in Seattle. So a bit more information is coming out. Los Angeles Times had a story as well. Marble was a native of Los Angeles. Where would they get that from? Not from local sources in Los Angeles, they got that from the reports up in British Columbia, um, the, where, where he'd been identified as being, uh, being the, uh, from, from Los Angeles. And a bit more information there, but this is from wire services. There would have been local reporters on the scene who would have been writing this story. And this story would have gone on the wires and then been published in several different newspapers. The Los Angeles paper played it up simply because he was from allegedly, allegedly from, from Los Angeles. Um, Soper only paid Marble $10 while he himself received $200. So getting, I, I get again, a bit more information about what the deal was. San Francisco Chronicle, um, Charles Marble of Edison near Tacoma, Washington, which is relevant because Edison, if you look on a map of Washington state now, you'll find Edison at the north end of the, of the state, not near Tacoma. At the, the name Edison was used back in the day, 100 years ago, for an area that's now called South Tacoma. After, after the name was no longer used there, it was adopted further up, the, further up the state. Marble was a novice, never been in a balloon before. Um, he died of fright. His feet were tied to the ropes of the parachute. He fell head downward. Um, and then Soper tried to get someone else to do it, but but uh, the, the following day, but uh, the, the authorities said, no, we can't do that. Uh, again, just as a bit more information comes up with all of these news reports. Los Angeles Herald, criminal charge may be filed against Professor Soper uh, because of, because, you know, and, and even alleged um, Soper was guilty of the murder. It has, it has the initials now of the stepfather of Marble, A.A. A. Cook of Excelsior, Washington. Seattle paper was working on it as well at the same time. Um, Charles Marble was, was going to New Westminster, had been in Seattle about two weeks, worked as a dishwasher at the Michigan restaurant. That was Soper's restaurant. Uh, so basically it's, it's coming very, very clear uh, through all of these stories that he had been hired by, the, by Soper at the restaurant Sober was going up to do this balloon ascension. He convinced Marble to do it for him. He paid him $10 to do it. To probably told him it was fine. But the, what you're getting here is the fact that, so, that, that Marble had no experience. Despite what was said at the, at the inquest, Marble had no experience of this kind of thing. 
And then, you know, diving a bit further in to get more evidence of this, you find Alfred H. Soper in the Seattle directories. Um, he ran the Michigan res restaurant at 216 Washington. And for the record, that's where 216 Washington is now. It's less, you know, according to Google, Google Street Views, it's a, uh, it when the, when the Google, Google car went by, it was a vacant lot. So the scoop on Charles is that he was um, 21 years old, not 26. His stepfather was A.A. A. Cook from an, from an insurance agent from, uh, from Auburn, Washington. So you do a bit more digging based on what you've learned in newspapers. This is not from official documents. And now you're diving into other records here based on what you learned in newspapers. Tacoma Directory, Albert A. Cook uh, in the 1893 Directory. 1880 Census, Sacramento County. And, you know, taking it further back because because you do some searches online, you find A.A. A. Cook. And there are, th there are three kids named Marble living with A.A. A. Cook and his wife, E.J. Cook. And they're all, the marbles are all identified as, as uh, step sons. So this is not Los Angeles, this is Sacramento County. And Charles was born in Massachusetts. Do a bit more digging, looking for, for in, in Massachusetts uh, birth records. And you find, you find uh, uh, different Charles. The one we want is Charles Augustus because it wasn't Charles H, it was Charles A in the end. And he was born in Lynn, Massachusetts and there are his uh, siblings. Then you do a, do a, a more checking than Massachusetts Directory, 1875. There are there are different marble families there. Uh, 1880, the marbles in Lynn, and then you, then you look a bit further back. You end up in Maine, as you're dealing with all of these these all of these people. And there's 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 the mar there's William D. Marble's marriage to Emma J. Stewart. That's E. J. E. J. Stewart who became E. J. Marble who became E. J. Cook, and you're back in Maine. And all of this is fairly straightforward forward research just by going from one step to another to another as you move along. Uh, here are the marbles in the 1870 census from Maine. What we know about Charles is Charles A. Not H. He was born in Massachusetts in 1874. The mother is Emma J. Father is likely William D. The grandfather is likely Oliver Marble, born 1800. All of this information came about because we started doing research in newspapers. That's that. That was the 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 key thing here. We did the research in newspapers rather than relying on the official document because the official document led us to a dead end. The official record was that. That information was was the core information on the official record, and and he, it said that he was born in 1868, more or less, in in Los Angeles. The next one I want to talk about is Peter and Augustine Vanderkin. Boldly crossing the border where nobody had crossed before. That's a bit of a Star Trek play. Sorry for that. I noticed this guy about 20 years ago again when I was looking through other records, other Canadian records, like border entry records. I realized, hey, there was one border crossing where only one couple ever crossed. Um, there, you know, there's there, as as you go through looking at all the border crossing points across Canada, there was only one spot. There was one spot where only two people ever crossed. And that is now showing up in, in other rock records as well. The Surrey Public Library in British Columbia, which has a, a fairly major um, genealogical collection uh, for Karameas, notes that there's only one page and only one family cross, the name was Vanderkin. So other people have found this as well. Karameas for the record, there, there you see Vancouver, it's well off to one side, it's off the beaten path. Um, there, there are more obvious spots to cross the border um for whatever reason they went they went through Karameas and as I say they were the only people who did but why would they do that that's the, that's the record that shows uh where they were from um Wisconsin USA uh arrived on the railway um and they were going to Princeton British Columbia which is very very close to Karameas so it made sense and uh, Vanderkin was a bookkeeper so you go back looking for Vanderkin in, in in Green Bay newspapers to find out whatever information you can. And here's here's something that kind of is, is painful. Peter Vanderkin had the forefinger of his right hand cut off this forenoon while operating a ripsaw in the table factory. Um, not a not a, not a, not a pleasant thing that you would that you would want to come across, but there we have it. Uh, Centralia in Washington State, 1911. Um, James R. Stevens and Peter C. Vanderkin 
uh, were going to deal with something called the Castle Rock contract. They were they were into into um, in industrial activity at the time. Um, James R. Stevenson and uh, Peter C. Vanderkin have arrived home from a trip to Castle Rock. This is in the Twice a Week Spokesman Review, uh, which was published in, in Spokane, Washington. And twice a week, uh, it was a daily, news, daily newspaper called the Spokesman Review. The twice a week version was basically a collection of stories that had appeared in the daily, and the twice a week one went to the outlying areas. It wasn't in the city center itself, went to much more distant areas, sort of a compilation of news from the, from the, from the daily newspaper. So when you find a, 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 a newspaper with, with a name like that, these, these, you know, the weekly or the daily or, or weekly or twice week, whatever, if there was already a daily being published by that name, these were simply sort of the, the compilation type newspapers. And you can probably find that story in the regular daily paper as well. 1914 Green Bay Semi-Weekly Gazette, I'm saying the same thing here. It's, you know, there, there'd be the, 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 the daily paper plus the semi-weekly. Um, marriage license, Peter Vanderkin of Portland and Augustine Storder of Green Bay, Wisconsin. So Peter is now in Portland. And the 1918 um, uh, First World War registration. Um, you'll find on, on this, it's very, very blurry. This is what I got, got off Ancestry, very, very blurry. But you can still on the second page, you can see uh, the reference to the index finger of the right hand. You know, a reference to that newspaper story. If you just found this record, and, and you didn't check the newspapers, you would wonder what happened to that finger. Go back to the newspaper, now you know. 1920 census for Peter, or for, for Portland. Uh, there are Peter and, and Augusta, it says there, in, in Portland. So their, their foray into British Columbia did not last very long at all. They were back relatively quickly. Um, mentioned as well in the, uh, in the paper from Sheboygan in 1938. Um, and a, lot, uh, the, the, a fairly major, major list of relatives, which is really, really cool to come across. And all I'm doing here is I'm searching for Peter Vanderkin, and I got this. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Vanderkin celebrating their 54th wedding anniversary. But as you look at the, uh, the, the names here, you'll see Peter Vanderkin, of, Mr. and Mrs. Peter Vanderkin of Portland, Oregon, um, other relatives, but then you, you find that there's a variation in the name. There are people named Vanderkin and people named Vanderkinter. So Vanderkin would be a shortened version of Vanderkinter. So that is telling me that, hey, as I go into, into earlier records, I might be finding a, a name variation that's a fairly substantial name variation. It's not just a, a different spelling. It's actually another, another syllable added onto the name or removed from the name as time went on. So again, that's giving a, a pretty good clue for doing further research. And... Uh, Peter Vanderkin, 79 years old, former Green Bay resident, died while visiting relatives in San Diego. His home was in Portland, Oregon, where he lived for the past 50 years. And that was in the Green Bay paper in 1960. So the, an obituary for him ran at where he was born, where he hadn't lived, hadn't lived there for, for half a century, but he still had relatives there. So the obituary ran there. Mrs. M.L. Ferguson, another example of doing, doing newspaper research. Mrs. M. L. Ferguson was a fascinating, fascinated me because I, I found references to this early directory of Yukon and Alaska done at the time of the Klondike Gold Rush in the 1898-1899. Um, a directory was compiled by Mrs. M. L. Ferguson. And um, who was she? Well, you know, there's got to be a story there about, you know, did she go up there with her husband? Was she, what was going on here? And it was a pretty tough area to get to anyway. So um, Remarkable that she'd be there, but there were plenty of women in the Klondike. I'm not, I'm not saying that it was unusual, but just um, there were plenty of women, but but they were vastly outnumbered by by men. And going up there and not working on the golders, but actually compiling a directory seems unusual. So I started doing some searches for her. Um, I had been told that she was from, or I saw a reference somewhere that she was from Los Angeles. Uh, so I did some basic searches. Uh, for for M. L. Ferguson, uh, but I don't know the first names, uh, so I'm really really lost. This is a, an early search I did on Ancestry, really lost because I have only only initials. 
Um, so what do you do at that point? You start guessing. And I guessed Maria because it just seemed to make sense. And uh, Mary, Maria, whatever, that, that's my starting point. And uh, looking for, for, for different people I could find. The very first one there is Maria L. Ferguson, born 1842 in Missouri. What are the odds that someone who is pushing 60 uh, would be walking into the Klondike? Uh, that was sort of a young person's type of thing. So I kind of discounted that first one there. But what else have I got? There are, there are a few references to her, but um, I'm not getting anything definitive yet. I did find a reference just by doing a straight Google search. Here is, here's a reference to a house built in, in Los Angeles for Mrs. N. L. Ferguson in 1906. Eight room house, two brick chimneys to be built at the cost of $5,000. Um, so it sounds like a very notable house, uh, a remarkable house, et cetera. The establishment was renamed San Carlos Hotel, et cetera. Um, house, uh, house had a facelift, et cetera, et cetera. This website, which is dealing with architecture, not with people, include a photograph of the house and a uh, really remarkable, really classy looking building. On Google Street Views, I found another photo of the house and it was on Ocean View Boulevard, which of course is in, it's, I found interesting because from the front patio, according to Google Street Views, you'll see the back of an apartment building, not the ocean, but a really, really high-end house, a really remarkable house. So clearly, if this Mrs. M. L. Ferguson is the same person, she was very successful. There's a site called Canadiana, uh, canadiana.ca that has a bunch of old newspapers. And since she was active in the Klondike, it's kind of obvious that that's a place to look for any references to Mrs. M. L. Ferguson. She had done the work on the directory there. That was for sure. Los Angeles, Los Angeles was maybe, but Klondike was for sure. So check there. And sure enough, I got a hit the Daily Klondike Nugget. There's a reference to Mrs. Ferguson, a Los Angeles capitalist who will arrive on the city of Seattle today en route to Dawson. To look after her interests, which she has there. One of the most energetic businesswomen to ever come to the North. Last year, she compiled a directory of the Klondike, other parts of the North. It is in con connection with this directory that she is making her present trip. Mrs. Ferguson visited Nome this summer. And there's a dash and it says Alaskan. What does that mean? That means that this, the Klondike Daily Nugget, picked up that story from another newspaper. It's, it's, uh, that's how, how information was shared between newspapers back in the day before the creation of wire services and so on. So you're looking, you're looking at something that they picked up from another newspaper, might've got it by, 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 by telegram or whatever. It might've have, might have come in as uh, um, when the mail came in, who knows? But it's, it's, it's a paper published in Alaska and they have grabbed the story from that, that. Then below that, it sort of clarifies the Dawson director, which Mrs. Ferguson filed did not materialize. Uh, she received permission from the council to issue a director of Dawson, but that is as much progress as was made. And then we know that she eventually got the thing done. So um, this was an earlier story before the, before the work was completed. Go on to newspapers.com to see what else you can find about her, Mrs. M.L. Ferguson. Right away in the San Francisco paper, I find a reference to uh, the daughter of Mrs. M. L. Ferguson and sister of Charles Eaton, et cetera, Los Angeles. So there's a reference to Los Angeles. It's in, a, it's in a California newspaper, so this could be it. But again, this is the adult daughter dying in 1898. So again, this Mrs. Ferguson, Mrs. M. L. Ferguson would have been, again, 60-ish by the time the Mrs. M. L. Ferguson went to the Klondike. So is this the person or not? few more references, uh, looking to what, whatever I can find. Mrs. M. L. Ferguson and different papers across the country, uh, but not really helpful. You have to narrow it down somehow. So I, I looked for, for Washington State, thinking that she would have had to go um, from Washington, uh, probably left from Seattle on, on a boat, boat north. And uh, so a bit of, uh, bit of you know, digging in there right away. I, feel, I see a good potential story. Valuable work to be compiled, a director of Alaska by Mrs. M. L. Ferguson. And so this is, this is from the paper in Seattle. And again, it's pretty tough to read because some digitization has, has, is you know, based, based on microfilm, the microfilm itself might have been blurry, dark, whatever. 
So it's kind of tough to read, but it does get into the details of, of what she was doing. Um, she, the directory grew out of her work to, uh, to name the streets and number the houses. Um, so it, it made, uh, made a lot of sense at the time that she was doing all of that to do the directory as well. So she got the contract that way. Um, so quite active. Then knowing that she's from California, looking for more Mrs. M.L. Ferguson, San, San Bernardino County Sun, talking about, a, about, a, about an orange crop. Um, there's another reference there, Mr. and Mrs. J.N. Horn, Mrs. Ferguson returned from Alaska. I'm looking for any reference to Alaska all the time. Um, so they are now um, at the home of uh, Mrs. Mrs. M.L. Ferguson, number 649 South Hope Street, all three having returned from Alaska on Friday. Part of that, that story continues, Mrs. Ferguson, a resident of this city, has mining interests in Dawson, has gone there each summer for several years. She owns an orange grove at Colton, last spring took her oranges, a bit of a typo there, to Dawson, where she sold them for $20 a box. She has also just completed the publication of a directory of Alaska, which she sells for $10 a copy. She has obtained a concession for three years and only smiled when the reporter suggested that it would probably prove to be a gold mine. So here's, here's someone who is incredibly active in business um, in, in many different ways. And she was, you know, she, all the evidence shows that she had a very, very successful um, orange growth, that she was in, in, in agriculture uh, already in California. She had mining interests in Dawson. She was, she was still pushing forward and doing a lot of stuff. Um, Another reference in, in Los Angeles Times to the directory, night from 1900. Um, looking for hard information on Mrs. M.L. Ferguson. And again, San Bernardino is, is where you'd be looking because that's where Colton is. Um, and here's a reference, Mrs. Charles Eaton and daughter of, of Los Angeles will visit, will visit Mrs. Eaton's mother, Mrs. Ferguson. And that obituary that we saw from California referred to the Eatons as well as Mrs. Ferguson. So that means that this Mrs. M.L. Ferguson is the one who was, was born around 1842. Um, so she was, she was, as I say, pushing 60 when she went up to, the, up to Alaska, which is, um, I think it's even more remarkable because it was not a, it was a young person's kind of thing to do, not someone, not someone my age. And then, then I found this story, which was a bit earlier, um, where basically he, she was threatened with murder um, because, because, because of a, a, a business deal gone bad. And uh, she basically uh, stared the guy down and uh, did not, uh, did not uh, give the money and so on. She just, she, uh, and, and off they went to court. She died 1914 uh, at her residence, number 2419 Ocean View Avenue. Last Tuesday, she was 71 years of age, had lived in Los Angeles for 42 years. The widow of the late Iowa Ferguson came from Missouri, leaves, it, leaves the Eaton and, and the grandchildren Eaton and Hayes. So it all ties into the other stories. And her, uh, her grave appears on, on Find a Grave. The the original reference I saw on this uh, said it has the death date of 1917, not 1914, which was wrong. Um, the tombstone was misread by whoever did the compilation. Um, one of my, when I mentioned that to one of my friends who's active on Find the Grave, she got a correction done on the site, make it right. And there is the tombstone for her. Maria L. Ferguson. So, some of the issues with OCRing, OCRing, optical character recognition, is um, is how how a lot of material, all the material basically for digitized newspapers, is made accessible to you, because someone has to run that, run those those image files through a computer software um, of some sort that that will that will identify the the letters in it will, that will turn it into actual usable text. And it's not always easy to do that kind of thing. You're dealing with an early, early newspaper such as this. The newspaper itself is quite often readable. But what if there's a, a sort of a crease down the page or whatever? That'll change things. What if there are different uh, type sizes? Some old newspapers had very, very tiny, tiny type. Um, a a uh, 
when, when you're dealing with with a newspaper um the larger type will be easier for the for the for the software to process the smaller type it's, it's more of a challenge there's less space between the lines and so on it'll get the software could get confused so always be careful when you're dealing with that and be aware of the limitations in terms of the source documents for digitization the vast majority of newspapers being digitized um, are being digitized from microfilm because those images have already been captured it uh, you can you can do you can do 10 uh, images from from a roll of microfilm for the cost of doing one from paper so if you want to see a whole lot of papers getting digitized quickly you go from microfilm but it, it does create a, a problem or two down the road now optical character recognition uh, software creates a text file and that is what you're searching when you're searching when you do a search say on newspapers.com you're not searching that image you're searching the text file that is tied to that image so it so therefore it matters to you the quality of that text file uh, if there are limitations on the text file it'll slow down your searches and or make make some make some things impossible to find this is an ad that I copied from the original newspaper, June 20th, 1868. It's all quite readable. Like, even look at the, look at the, at the towards the bottom there, the, the line that is in smaller, smaller type. You know, also a large quantity of, of Nairn and companies, etc. So it's all readable. That is from the microfilm. Um, the problem with microfilm is that um, uh, this role could have been put through the, um, through the uh, through a reader many many times could be scratched up there could be um there could be problems of one form or another there could be a bit of thread there it could be a, be a bit of dust on the image whatever uh, all of those extra lines will confuse the ocr process so they those people who are doing this kind of thing are looking for the best copy of the micro microphone they can find um, but you can't look at every single roll of microfilm that's out there. You have to go to the library that probably has the best, the best quality, or the like library or archive has has the best quality um, copy. And uh, but you can see, like like in the word where it says furniture, um, how confused the OCR software would be seeing seeing that extra bit of line and so on there. From the internet, what this tells you right away is that the the microfilm copy that I showed you is was not the one used for for the internet, because it's in much much better shape. It's not nearly as bad as the one that I showed you. So it's a good thing they found a different copy. The one that I showed you came out of our own library at at, at, at our newspaper. This one this one that they use came from a different library that where where it's not a, where it hasn't been used nearly as much. But this is what it looks like when it's OCR'd. Fountain Place, and there you go. Um, the next word is uh, is wrong. Of is correct. The next word is wrong. The next word is wrong. Douglas Streets, that's correct. New and second hand, those are correct. And then it gets bad. You've got bedding, table cutlery, wood and willow, children, something, large largo quantity, uh, paper hangings, etc. Like that's that is the text that you are searching in if you're looking for that ad. So you have to be really, really creative. What if, what if the one surname that you're looking for um, was misread? What if the L turned into what? What if, what if the L was was read as being a, a one? Um, you know, you know, by by the software, then you're going to be confused. You're going to have a problem getting that that thing. So when you when you do a search, be creative. Search for many different different uh, spellings and, and assume typos, just to see what happens. Here's another one. Uh, this I'm showing it in reverse. I'm showing the OCR text first. Um, and that, the, again, this is the text that if you're searching for a certain item, this is the kind of text that you're actually searching in. The text is not always perfect. Now there, there are different versions or different ways to do it. Um, the more expensive OCR process will give you better results. But again, that means there are limited budgets out there um you will not find as many uh, as many pages that have been done if if the if the higher priced uh, uh ocring has been done but you look at this and how little there is here that you could actually search on you can search on many terms that you think are going to be in the ad but you've got to guess at which one is going to be going to be found 
like Monday morning is easy, but who's going to search on Monday morning anyway? They're looking for other things there. Um, further down, it mentions Soda Creek. Um, and that might, you know, that's probably other than the really, really short words that you never want to search on. That's about it in terms of what's, uh, what's available. That's what the, what, that's what the actual document was. I just showed the OCRing from, from that. And there it's readable. Um, very, very straightforward. Uh, but what, what I could find in the, in the, uh, the OCR version was Monday morning and Soda Creek. All the rest of it was not properly digitized. And again, roll through it. That's the microfilm, a bit, a few more problems on it. And that's the, the copy that I found on the internet that is tied into the, the, uh, that OCR version. And I don't see much, much wrong with this. Like, like it should have been fairly easy to read it, but maybe there was sort of bleed through from the back, from the, from the, the text on the back, because you can see the, the text coming through to a certain extent. Maybe that is what confused it, but it was a fairly, a fairly bad example. Uh, final example along this line. Um, this is a story I found, a uh, town up in way up in Northern British Columbia called Smithers, uh, named after a guy named Alfred Waldron Smithers, Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad. Um, I've been looking for a story on this and this one did not pop up uh, when I when I did the uh, all my, my searches. Um, I found this by going through page by page by page through a digitized newspaper to see to come across this one. Um, so why didn't I find it? Which words are there to look for when you're doing a search? And this, again, this applies no matter where you're doing a search. You've got to, you've got to be creative in your searches, no matter what paper it is you're looking at. This one happens to be from British Columbia. It could be from anywhere in the world. The basic rules apply here. The search, the search terms you would use, ones I could think of would be Smithers, Grand Trunk, Waldron, Prince Rupert, Prince George, Alfred Waldron Smithers, Alfred W. Smithers, and Grand Trunk Pacific. Now, the longer the search term that you use, the more risk you have of having a typo in there. So you want to have nice short search terms. But those are the ones that I, I thought, these are, these are the words that actually make sense. You don't want to search on by or the or after or its or only or between or some because you'll get, you'll get a million hits that won't help you. You've got to narrow it down in some way. But which are the words to search for? That is what the text looked like. That's what the OCR text looked like. And again, this is a horrendous example. Um, so which, which word of the ones that I identified before, which word actually works here? And the only one that is not, that is not, does not have a typo in it uh, is Waldron. And why on earth would you search for someone's middle name? But that is the only word that worked. So again, if you don't find what you're looking for with your first search on a newspaper site, keep on looking and looking and looking. You might find something with a, with a variation on it. You might find by searching for, for just a different word, you know they were in a certain spot, try that, try that. Always keep your search terms as short as you can to, to increase the odds of avoiding type, typos. One, moving away from the actual OCR, you know, what the text you're looking at, some examples of what you find. Um, my last name is Obi, it's a really simple name four letters, O-B-E-E, -E. how can you get it wrong? Um, but OCR is not perfect. I searched for OB um, in, a, in a, one, of, one of the newspaper sites, and I found references to a guy named OB. Um, no relation of mine, but they were still, it's re still they were interesting to me, but also uh, the word once. And I said to myself, okay, if I'm getting that, what would I search on to get to get the other OBs I'm missing? Like, is there an, an obvious word that I, I should try to get the other ones? Because I know I'm missing some because they've been, they've been uh, badly um, OCR, whatever. I get all kinds of variations. So there must be some a variation that I can try that will get me the missing OBs. It hasn't worked. So I, I, I thought I would look for oboe because it's an obvious thing like that E could be, you know, something could be just, you know, a bit of type could be missing or added in, whatever, try oboe. I did get one oboe. I also got embossed, I got cheese, I got dodge, I got once, I got office. And my favorite of all is the word stet, S-T-E-T, -E upside down um, in a crossword puzzle um, answer. 
And the OCR software looked at that and said, that says OBO. So that's the reason I sort of, you know, cover this point is just make you aware of just the limitations of the, of what we're searching, of the text files we're searching. Here's another one that uh, for, for a relative of mine, um, this one did not pop up for me in, uh, in uh, when, I, when I did a search um, using, you know, it should have been in the newspaper. I knew it was in the newspaper. It didn't come up for me in the, in the search. And the reason for it is because the original document that was, that was uh, microfilmed, the page in the newspaper that was microfilmed was too blurry. Uh, so I could identify this. I was pretty confident I had the right, uh, the right person looking for the last name of Gerlach. And I'm pretty sure I had the right person. This is the paper in Saskatoon in, in Canada. Um, and I confirmed it when I found the death of his wife, an obit for the death of his wife. And based on that, I was able to go back and confirm I had the right obituary. Um, once you know what you're looking for, you can go in from, from the one you can read easily. You can go back and identify those same words in the blurry one. And I've, I've tried, you know, unblurring that, deblurring, whatever the word would be, uh, using Photoshop. I wasn't able to do that, but I was able to determine which words are which, using all the names of all of the descendants, the kids, etc. in the good copy, go back into the other copy, and then I could see, I could spot the variations. Otherwise, it would have been taken far too long to try to decipher that. So that kind of thing is also a problem. You know, the, the, the OCR software cannot read uh, blurry type. When you're dealing with searches, remember um, more than just names. Don't just look at the names of, of, of people in question. Um, be a bit more creative than that. Try to find other other ideas. Uh, here is um, uh, a death record from my great grandfather, William Montgomery in Vancouver. Um, and at first glance, it's pretty easy to read this because he was William Montgomery. He was 40 years old and lives at, uh, on West 23rd. Um, but that's not right. Um, the 40 was actually, 40 was the house number, not, not, an, not his age. The, the comma there would, would tend to slow people down a bit. Uh, William Montgomery of 40 West 23rd Avenue, uh, survived by his wife and three daughters. And you can see my connection to him right there. Um, again, fairly straightforward information. 40 West 23rd. So I then looked for 40 West 23rd. And I've searched for that address in the Vancouver newspapers, just to see what happened to my great grandfather's house after he died. And closing an estate within a matter of, of, of weeks after he died, uh, his wife had uh, moved in with her, with, with a daughter from her first marriage and um, the house was for sale. And uh, there we are, 40 West 23rd, cash offers wanted. I would not have found that if I looked for the name Montgomery. And furthermore, a bit more information here. Uh, where did the wife move to? 2047 East 33rd. That was listed in another newspaper story. And, and that was the address of one of her, one of her other children. Uh, so again, just a bit more information that sort of fleshes out the story possible from these, these things. Um, getting close to the end here from, from the Manitoba News in Morden, Manitoba. Um, on Friday night last, uh, Friday last, a disgraceful affair occurred at a farmhouse a few miles north of Nelson. A certain well-to-do farmer and his wife could not get along in harmony. A separation was mutually agreed upon, and the two lived on separate farms, the children being left with the mother. The wife engaged a man to attend to the work of her farm. This man is engaged to the eldest unmarried daughter of the separated couple. He appears to have conducted himself to the satisfaction of the employer. A feeling was worked up in the neighborhood which found vent on Friday night in the assembling of 10 or 12 disguised men who went to the house, knocked down the hired man, hauled him up to the stable, partially undressed him, and applied a coating of tar. Um, a few wicked kicks administered, it is said, by the indignant husband completed the punishment inflicted on the badly frightened victim. This was from 1886. Um, you'll notice that there are no names in the story, but I found that but when I was going through page by page, reading every single story in that newspaper. And, and this one just leapt out at me. Uh, no names were given, it's a perfect fit. 
the correct location just north of Nelson, um, a small town, now a ghost town near Morden, and all of the correct family details. My great grandparents had split up and um, the, the eldest unmarried daughter and the hired man ended up moving to Australia. They got married, moved to Australia, then to New Zealand which is why I've got cousins in New Zealand to this day. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a perfect, perfect match for my family. And I can't swear for sure that it is my family, but um, it, 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 as I say, it sounds so, so right. I, I can't, I have to think it is. Mistakes happen. Um, this one I came across a few years ago, um, basically saying that uh, a guy named Maynard uh, beloved husband of Marie Morrison uh, died, and there, then below that, there's a, there's a death of someone named Morrison, survived by his wife Marie. And I you kind of say that you say to yourself, "Golly, that seems odd." Um, the following day, uh, the correct obituaries appeared. Maynard's wife was actually the Nora Maynard. They had simply taken the information be from two obituaries and confused things, got things wrong between the two. So. If something seems really unusual, double check it. You might find a correction in the paper the next day. You might find the story is reprinted. And in this case, an obituary would be reprinted because it's a paid ad and they will, they will make sure that it, that it gets right. So always do that kind of thing. Check to see what you can find. Anyway, so the, the sources, as I said, there are, there are major, major ones, but also check for smaller regional sites as well. Uh, you might find some sites that are free. You might find, find some information available through Ancestry, Find My Past, and so on. A lot of information has been put on online. A lot of papers have been put online. And sometimes there are indexes to papers um, that, that, that will help get, get, get you into the proper, proper sites. Indexes that were done manually, like you know, by eye, as opposed to the computer-generated indexes. Major sites, again, newspapers.com newspaperarchive.com, Genealogy Bank. These are the three that I, I subs have subscribed to for quite some time because they're, they're, they, they have different collections. Um, when people ask on, on Facebook or whatever, which site should I use for newspaper research? It kind of depends on where you're looking. So you got to figure out what, 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 which of these sites would have the, your papers of interest and then take it from there. Uh, regarding notes, um, you should always have the name of the publication, the place, the date, the page number, the URL, if it's off the internet, and make copies of what you find. And you'll see it in my talk in a couple of spots. I, I took the examples of these years ago, and somewhere along the way, I've lost the dates, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, but I actually need to leave them in there just as a reminder that you should always include the dates. And more often than not in my in my genealogical research as i've as i've obtained new information or whatever i have simply, simply figured i will never forget where i got that so why would i write it down i've been doing research now for more than 40 years and i've forgotten a lot more than i've than i actually remember right now so always write down the, this this kind of thing i knew the dates of these things i have them written somewhere um, but I didn't include them in the talk. So please, when you're doing this kind of thing, always, always, always write it down and include it with the thing. Don't be like me. Newspapers can help, as I said, add details and context, confirm information, correct and clarify official records, fill in gaps, um, and answer the why question. And all of the examples that I've shown today point to all of this kind of thing. Um, I would not have ever found Charles Marble's birth if I'd relied on the official record as an example. I, what would I have done for, for Mrs. M.L. Ferguson without newspapers to, to point me to who she was? And I actually found it an actually absolutely engaging story to realize that she, how active she was and how, what an amazing business person she was um, at a time when you wouldn't expect that kind of thing to be happening. Um, the details, the context. Charles Marble was, was wearing pink tights when he went up and fell to his death. That's the kind of detail that makes a difference. And if, if you can find that in, in your own family, it actually makes for much, much stronger research. There are some guides to newspaper research out there. This is one that's done by the people who put, put out the Internet Genealogy Magazine, a genealogist guide to newspaper research uh, by Gina Filbert Ortega. It's worth taking a look at. It is also by James Beadler, Family Tree Historical Newspapers Guide, how to find your ancestors in archived newspapers. There are also guides to um, uh, newspaper research in England and Germany and so on and so on, but I, I couldn't show them all. Um, 
but depending on where you're doing research, you'll, you'll, you should be able to find a, find a reference of some sort. You'll find also uh, some books that, that identify newspapers by state or by province, uh, just saying what's available for each community, uh, in, in, uh, which will help you narrow it down, uh, give you an idea of, what, of where you might find records and which ones to look for. And with that, again, the handout is on daveobi.com and uh, just click where it says handout. You'll get a four page PDF on newspaper research. And my, my uh, the site that I have for, uh, for Canadian research is Can Genealogy. Please use it because I, that's where I put all the best links and so on as best I can. It's kind of similar to Cindy's list, only devoted to Canada. And uh, I hope you'll get some, some benefit from it. And thank you very much for, for, for spending part of your, your Thursday with me. And with that, any questions, thoughts? Anna, we're here. Hi, um, yeah, there's one question. Terrell Mills asks, what site did you use to find the Alaska gold stories? Uh, those were, most of the stories were on newspapers.com, uh, but the one, the, the, the Klondike Nugget, that was on canadiana.ca. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then we have someone thanking you, um, and I don't see any other questions okay. out there, so we'll just close it up. Um, thank you, Dave, so much for uh, presenting with us. That was, I really enjoyed listening to that one. Um, all those stories are so cool. Great. Um, and um, thank you for everybody for attending um, this webinar today, and we hope you will join us for our next webinar, which will be on um, March 24th, where are all the rest of the records on the Family Search website and update with James Tanner. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. And you can do that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Bye-bye.